Good day, folks. This is Patty Corbett Ward, and once again, I would like to welcome you to a new segment of Learning Thursdays. As many of you can probably recite back to me, and for those of you who are new, the Learning Thursdays um, series was developed as a way to offer free learning opportunity to those in our field as a way of helping to enhance the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes as you go into your clinical space and look to work to help improve the lives of those individuals who come to your program, be it prevention, treatment, or recovery. The presentation you are going to watch today is entitled Justice Center Oversight and Monitoring and will be presented by Tricia Allen, Counsel's Office, and also David Herbert from Oasis Program Review. That being said, I would like to welcome Trish and Dave. Thank you for offering your time. And if you're ready, I'd like to hand it off to you. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Welcome to today's Learning Thursday. We are going to be talking about Justice Center Oversight and Monitoring. My name is Trisha Allen. I'm a senior attorney at Oasis Counsel's Office. Hi, I'm Dave Herbert. I'm the Program Review Unit Manager at OASIS. Thanks, Dave. All right, so just a reminder, if you want to have, or if you want to send any questions to us, uh, please send them to learningthurs at oasas.ny.gov. So for today's agenda, what we're going to do is we're going to talk through a brief overview of Justice Center incident reporting. Um, then we're going to go through the role of the provider in developing a corrective action plan. We're also going to talk through our process at OASIS for looking at and approving corrective action plans. And then we're going to cover a little bit about what the role of the Justice Center is after OASIS has closed out a corrective action plan um, when they're looking at the corrective action plans themselves and conducting audits. So a brief overview, um, what is an incident? Now, what we're talking about when we're talking about the Justice Center, um, as a reminder, typically um, we're talking about mandated reporters, which is essentially everyone in the program, anyone who is hired by the program, if it's an intern, if it's a contractor, so uh, a very broad number of individuals, and they are required to report certain incidents to the Justice Center. Um, when we talk about an incident, we're talking about an accident or an injury, um, something that would affect the patient's health or safety. Um, there are two types of incidents. There's non-reportable incidents, so those are incidents that, while not required to be reported to the Justice Center, could be potentially relevant to OASIS. An example of this would be where an individual is requesting help finding a treatment program. If they were to call into the Justice Center, that would be referred to OASIS, and then we would potentially reach out. Another circumstance might be where it's an issue that is uh, relevant to patient advocacy, um, in which case the Justice Center, once they classified that incident as non-reportable, Portable would refer that to OASIS and OASIS, OASIS patient advocacy would um, step in and, and reach out as needed. Um, and the other type of incident would be a reportable incident. So this is conduct that is uh, required to be reported to the Justice Center. That would include abuse, neglect, um, and significant incidents. So abuse and neglect. Um, what we're talking about with abuse is any improper action that results in or is likely to result in physical, mental, or psychological harm. So that would be an incident where a person receiving services was harmed physically, sexually, or psychologically by a custodian. Neglect, on the other hand, is any action, inaction, or lack of attention that breaches the, a custodian's duty and that results in or is likely to result in a physical injury or a serious or protracted impairment of the physical, mental, or emotional condition of the person receiving services. So we're going to go through some of the categories of uh, abuse and neglect and give some examples. So physical abuse would be uh, intentional or reckless contact, hitting, kicking, shoving, uh, corporal punishment, an injury which cannot be explained, a suspicious uh, injury, due to the extent or the location, a number of injuries at one time, or frequency of injuries over time. Psychological abuse is more taunting, name calling, using threatening words and or gestures. Sexual abuse is, uh, as you would know, inappropriate touching, indecent exposure, 
sexual assault, taking or distributing sexually explicit pictures, voyeurism or other sexual exploitation. And neglect, which we, we touched on before, is the failure to provide supervision or, to pro or the failure to provide adequate food, clothing, shelter, health care, or access to an educational entitlement. Now the deliberate misuse of restraint or seclusion uh, refers to the use of interventions with excessive force as a punishment or for the convenience of staff. Controlled substances, um, that would include using, administering, or providing any controlled substance contrary to law. Aversive conditioning refers to unpleasant physical stimulus used to modify behavior without person-specific legal authorization. And finally, obstruction, which is interfering with the discovery, reporting, or investigation of abuse, neglect, falsifying records, or intentionally making false statements. So just a note here, um, there originally uh, there was a requirement that all uh, OASIS programs uh, that were subject to Justice Center oversight were to report deaths. However, there has been a change, um, it, it was quite some time ago, but there was a change, um, and that change to um, all reports of deaths that occur on program premises or during the context of program activity. So if you're on an outing and there is a death that were to occur, that would be reportable to the Justice Center. However, um, for when a death occurs within 30 days of discharge, that's only for bedded programs. So if it's an outpatient program and a patient were to die after they were discharged from your program, uh, that is not reportable to the Justice Center unless there was some other aspect of it which required reporting, i.e. there was some abuse or neglect that occurred or um, if they were to die on your premises even though they were discharged. So just be mindful of that. Um, some additional notes that I will raise have to do with missing clients. So there is a standard for missing clients when it's reportable specific to residential programs. Um, when someone leaves AMA or ACA, depending on how your program refers to it, um, that is not considered a missing client. They've told you they're leaving, you have clear indications of it. Another circumstance where it would not be required to be reported is if the um, patient were to say to you, I'm gone, I'm sick of this program, I'm done, you know, they somehow made their decision to leave known to staff. Um, another note is for general medical events. If it's not if a patient goes to a hospital and it's due to some um, action or inaction of staff, so staff forgot to give them medication and they had an adverse reaction to that and so they had to go to the hospital, that would be reportable. Um, if the person stubbed their toe and broke their toe or um, you know, some other innocuous incident where they were injured but it, it's not having anything to do with the staff, that's not reportable. Um, there are some exceptions, however. Um, one very big exception, which is really important during the current epidemic, um, is if there's an overdose, that does need to be reported to the Justice Center. Uh, another thing that I will note is for uh, delayed discovery, um, there are circumstances where programs are able to delay discovery. So discovery is when you have a reasonable basis to believe that something happened. Um, I would remind you that it doesn't require that that something be corroborated by somebody else. However, in limited circumstances you are able to delay discovery um, only for 24 hours, no more. Um, it does require first that you reach out to your OASIS field office and let us know, or to OASIS generally, let us know that you're delaying discovery, meaning you're delaying reporting an incident to the Justice Center, only no more than 24 hours. Um, that's limited to circumstances where the person who's making the allegation has previously made false reports and there's no cooperation by anyone else in the program that something happened. If you have other indications, um, that's, that's insufficient. That's not grounds to delay. Um, or if there is some sort of condition that tends to cause that person to make false reports, um, then you have the ability to take 24 hours to gain a little bit more detail. But it's only 24 hours at the end. It still needs to be reported, and you must document it in the patient's record as well as notifying the office. Um, 
duplicate reports. This is um, originally when the Justice Center came into being, there was a requirement that all mandated reporters report. There is a limited exception where individuals who are mandated reporters are not required to report, and that is when they have um, direct and clear awareness that the incident has already been reported to the VPCR um, and that they have been named as a witness. So that is where you're watching your coworker make the report. You hear your name said. You know that it's been reported. Um, so I would uh, say that you need to be very cautious in using these. Make sure you follow them exactly to the letter um, just to make sure that you've done every step that needs to be done prior to to doing any type of delayed discovery or uh, failing to report. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, post-incident expectations. So what do you do immediately after an incident occurs? First of all, if it's an emergency, call 911. That's the most important thing I, I can tell you. Take care of that first. You need to ensure patient safety, uh, make sure the environment is stable, separate staff and clients as appropriate if, if it's a, a fight or a situation like that. Uh, you may need to conduct room or, or program searches of, of the facilities as well. After that's done, the, the immediate um, dealing with the issue, then re, you know, report the incident to the Justice Center and law enforcement as appropriate. Preserve the evidence, and we've included a link uh, to some further guidance in that area. And finally, also report it to the statewide central registry of child abuse and maltreatment, if applicable. Um, part of what Dave said was report the incident to the Justice Center. That's what we're kind of discussing, mandated reporters, types of incidents, et cetera. So what happens once you report it to the Justice Center? It goes through a process. Justice Center will look at the incident. They will determine if there's any type of abuse neglect or any type of indications that it's a significant incident, and they will classify that incident. As soon as that incident is classified, it will get sent out to OASIS staff. Um, we receive notice of an incident, um, probably almost instantaneously, I would say. Um, so OASIS will then, um, the, the field office is notified, and then there will be any follow-up actions taken by the field office. They may reach out to the program. They may go on site to view the program. Um, now, if the incident is classified as abuse neglect, um, the field office typically will reach out to the program and they will um, speak to the program either physically in person or by phone, uh, confirm patient safety, um, make sure that there's nothing um, additional support that we need to provide to the program. Um, at the same time, the Justice Center will begin their investigation. Um, once the Justice Center completes their investigation, they make a determination. They'll issue a determination letter to the provider. Um, OASIS also receives that um, determination. Usually it includes a um, Justice Center investigative report, um, and it will be substantiated or unsubstantiated. And then um, once it's substantiated or unsubstantiated, OASIS will reach out to the provider, and this is where the oversight and monitoring process begins. We will request some sort of corrective action plan from the provider. Um, for substantiated and unsubstantiated incidents after uh, the time period, which is 10 days, the provider is supposed to submit the corrective action plan back to us for review. Okay, so we're going to go into those steps uh, with a little more detail. So in the oversight monitoring process, OASIS requests the CAP from the provider, as, as Trisha mentioned. We would review any Justice Center recommendations and the provider corrective action plan for sufficiency and if needed we would also request additional information where the cap may be judged to be insufficient. So what does a provider need to do? Well the provider needs to really carefully review the determination letters and the entire investigation report which you'll receive the entire investigation report, who they talk to, when they talk to them, what sort of evidence they have to substantiate or unsubstantiate the, the findings. Um, the provider needs to really carefully consider issues of concerns identified either by the investigator, identified by OASIS, and or identified by program staff in the investigation report itself. So let's talk a little bit about what corrective action is that we're talking about. So generally speaking, corrective action is any action taken in response to an allegation of abuse and neglect um, which is considered corrective or preventative action or measure. 
So areas of systemic concern are issues identified that are not specific to one staff member, but require attention and correction across the, the spectrum of the program. So um, when we talk about a corrective action plan, bottom line is what we're asking for is what did you do to ensure that it doesn't happen again? Um, and to address any deficiencies. So some of the things that we've seen providers do, typical corrective action plan activities include uh, staff training. You may review a policy and procedure and determine that there was a deficiency in the policy and procedure, so you're going to amend the policy and procedure. Um, and then potentially there could be some sort of employment action. There's maybe a counseling memo done or some sort of reprimand issued to the um, involved employee. Um, there could be some sort of shift in the, the treatment services that you're offering or the structure of the programming. Um, what I would say is anything and everything that you do, as soon as you report that incident, anything you do to correct it, we want to know about it. All right, so I'll go into a little more detail about some of the types of corrective action. So program services or treatment, um, anytime you are going to add or modify services or treatment to improve services to meet uh, an individual receiving services, meet their needs and their, or their wishes, or any actions that bring the provider into compliance with the treatment or service plan or into compliance with regulations or into compliance with facility policies. Uh, other types might be personnel and training. That would be to implement or improve administrative oversight of staff supervision, staffing patterns, or staff training um, to, again, meet regulatory requirements or facility policies. So, segue into policies and procedures, uh, corrective action to implement or improve policies and procedures in order to meet regulatory requirements. Okay. So these are some additional types of corrective actions. Um, you may have some sort of, or you may take some sort of action to improve the incident management practices. So um, changes in internal and external reporting, uh, perhaps you increase or modify investigative procedures or reports, um, root cause analysis, something like that. Um, and also it includes incident review activities. Um, another type is physical, plant, or environmental. So if during the course of an investigation it's determined that a door doesn't lock properly, you take steps to correct that deficiency, fix the door, maybe put an alarm on the door, or um, increase some usage of surveillance technology, some, something to that effect. Um, so it would just be addressing any type of uh, physical, plant, or environmental issues that were identified. Um, there's also safety or basic needs or patient rights, so if there were some deficiency with food or perhaps the, um, the shelter that is provided to patients was found to be insufficient, there would be some sort of measure taken to correct that. Um, documentation, if there's a deficiency noted, perhaps there's documentation that's missing or incomplete, if it's corrected, um, that's considered a corrective action plan or a part of a corrective action plan. So, when is the cap required? The short answer, safest answer, always. Um, definitely with all substantiated findings, all substantiated findings must have a cap. In addition though, almost all unsubstantiated findings may and probably will require a cap. Uh, so again, back to substantiated, um, all of them require a cap, and additionally, any employment actions we're talking like termination of staff, suspension of staff. They also must be reported to the AARM, which is the Administrative Action Reporting Mechanism, sort of a subset of the VPCR. So unsubstantiated findings, even though they're unsubstantiated, oftentimes they identify some, it really just means that they couldn't legally prove that an action happened or a, an incident happened in the way it was alleged but they often identify issues that need addressing by the provider, by the program. Um, so again, if they're, that's why I really stress to read the whole investigation report because there may be some items in there that will cause you as a provider some concern and, and cause you to, to make some changes at your program that will hope, hopefully improve things. 
Okay. So uh, we've talked a lot about corrective action plans. How, how do you give us the corrective action plan? So we have what's called the SQA 55 Oversight and Monitoring Corrective Action Plan form. Um, this document is available on our Oversight and Monitoring webpage um, at oasas.ny.gov. So uh, we have, uh, we request this information from every provider whenever, whether or not you're doing a corrective action plan, what I would say is submit this form to us. So it just, it requires basic information, provider name, the executive director, email address, address or we can contact you. Um, that's for ease of communication. It allows us to uh, speak with you and, and get responses back a little bit quicker. Um, operating certificate number, BPCR serial number, uh, both case and incident number, um, and then incident location. So uh, when you fill that out, make sure you fill it out completely so that we can respond back to you. And then these are uh, probably somewhat difficult to read and I'm, I'm only including them just as a, a, an example or a, showing you kind of what the form looks like. These are the different types of areas of concern. Um, we ask that you fill out these boxes based on what activity you took, so employment, action, training, programs and services, policies and procedures, incident management, physical plant, documentation, and then safety, basic health needs. We ask that you fill out in the larger box um, under each section exactly what actions you took and then also document the name and title of the person who's responsible for implementing those and the date that the corrective action plan was needed. This allows us to uh, be aware of what activities you guys are taking um, and it also allows us to address or identify any deficiencies and communicate with you when we feel that there might be additional corrective actions that are needed. So regarding the CAP submission, uh, the request for the CAP is sent to the provider by mail with the SQA 55, which was just explained. Uh, uh, that form would be attached to the letter to each provider. And we request that the provider respond within 10 days to um, the address shown, which is oversight and monitoring at oasis.ny.gov. So I want to talk a little bit about appropriate CAP responses. So it's re really important that the CAP include examples of proof of implementation. So that might include trainings where we'd look for a sign-in sheet, uh, a termination or suspension letter if action was taken against an employee, and again that must also be reported to the AARM. Uh, it might be a revised policy and procedure, or it could be and could also include documentation of a complaint filed against a license or credential. And again, under l very limited circumstances, the provider may review all the documents and determine that no corrective action is required, but that's really the exception, not the norm. And actually, if I could just break in here for a minute. I think so you, you just did. Thank you, sir. Uh, so you, <laughs> you touched on documentation of a complaint filed against the license or credential. So um, I, I just want to point out the importance of this. Um, we have a credential which we oversee, um, and then we also have licensed individuals in our program. Um, while we recognize that there are circumstances where individuals may be terminated, we do also ask that you look at the incident that occurred and evaluate whether or not there is some ethical consideration that would require you or um, obligate you to file a complaint, especially if you are a credentialed individual yourself and we're talking about another credentialed individual, there is an ethical obligation on your part to report any type of violation that you're aware of. Um, in addition to that, um, if it is a significant or a serious incident, it is very important that we, um, as the credentialing agency or the other licensing agencies, are aware of the conduct so that we can take the appropriate action that we need to in terms of their license or credential. So. Yeah, it's just the right thing to do. F failure to respond to a request for a cap. Um, if we ask for a cap and, and we don't get a cap within the required time frame, we'll send some follow-up letters but eventually, if it goes on for long enough, we're talking about taking action against an operating certificate. It could include fines, uh, suspension, revocation, or even perhaps a restriction of funding if that's applicable. And I'm going to break in again. Sorry. <laughs> Please do, right? So, do. Um, you know, we recognize that when incidents happen, you, you guys take the actions that you have to take to make sure the patients are safe and to ensure that you're providing quality programming, and we do appreciate that. Um, I, I know that there are some um, 
frustrations with having to do all the, the paperwork and, and the time frames and everything. What I would say is um, we are absolutely not here to be a um, hard-nosed uh, unit. We What we want to do is we want to work well with providers to make sure that you guys get the information to us and, and if there's a way that we can help us or that we can help you guys, let us know. If you don't think you're going to make the 10-day deadline, just send us a note. If there's additional considerations, let us know. If it's a really giant stack of documents and you don't know how to email it to us, then mail it to us. Just you know, reach out to us if there's any issues. We're absolutely willing to talk and, and to help you work through whatever it is. Um, just get us the documents. Um, you know, it's, it's no fun sending nasty grams, so that's all I would say. Yeah, it's much more important to get the cap correct mm -hmm. rather than done it, get it done quickly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to touch a little bit on Justice Center audits, which I would um, hazard a guess not many people are aware of, or uh, if they are, some aspects of it might be new. So um, once the uh, OASIS team has looked at the corrective action plan submitted by the provider and determined that it's sufficient, we will close out the case. Um, however, the Justice Center does also have an auditing function within their um, their entity. And what they will do is they will implement the, or they will, sorry, they will audit the implementation of the corrective action plans. So what they are going to do is they could potentially reach out to you and request additional information. Um, and it could be outside of what we've requested um, and is likely in addition to what we've requested. They do have access to the documents that you submitted. So they are aware of and have read through the corrective action plan. But there may be other facets that they want to know about. Um, they could potentially do an on-site visit or some sort of uh, desk audit. If it is on-site, it is potential. There is some potential that the uh, on-site audit could be unannounced. Um, they may also do a, a separate type of audit, which is more of a systemic review. So just be aware that that can happen. Um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us or reach out to the Justice Center. Um, so a couple of FAQs, or frequently asked questions, I yeah, abbreviate everything. So um, part 836, that's the incident reporting regulations. Uh, live it, learn it, love it. Um, I know that <laughs> regulations are not always the funnest thing to read, but I, picked a different I find them riveting. Um, when in doubt, report. If you have questions about some incident that maybe happened and you're not sure if it's reportable, call us email us we're always there um, and then also uh, just a reminder we know that there are going to be some activities that providers take after an incident occurs initial responses but um, do make sure that you are not in the um, instances of a case of abuse and neglect going um, into the point of doing a full-fledged investigation um, which could potentially interfere with the justice center's investigation um, and then I mentioned this earlier, but field office does receive notification of all incidents. So if you have a question about what an incident was classified as, um, you know, they can help as well. I know that they're your kind of regional contact, and, and I believe that there's a lot of frequent contact between programs and their, their regional uh, field office mm -hmm. staff. So feel free to reach out then. Um, I'm kind of repeating myself. So <laughs> again, <laughs> it's worth it. Don't <laughs> don't begin uh, your own investigation after an incident. Um, you know, obviously preserve evidence if there is evidence. Um, make sure patients are safe. Gather the information you need to to take whatever immediate actions you need. Um, but make sure you don't begin your own investigation. Um, uh, a note, we've had this actually come up a couple of times. If you've got an incident that's been classified as a significant incident and you're doing kind of your own investigation of it and there's additional information that you find out that indicates more um, abusive or neglectful behavior has mm -hmm. happened, you know, if there's a new bit of information, call it in and report it because it could potentially cause that incident to be escalated. Um, so you know, just be careful, make sure that you, you report that as soon as you find out anything new. Um, and then, just a reminder, anything that you do, any action you take after an incident happens, you know, maybe you took the patient to the hospital, maybe you changed, I don't know, something, the policy and procedure for uh, searches, 
or um, maybe you shift around the staff roster, anything like that, that's a corrective action plan. And make sure you document it and make sure you share that with us. Yep, just some, some further useful things to remember. Um, agencies should really consider the issues of concern identified by the Justice Center and again, carefully review the investigation report for, for your own assessment of areas in need of improvement. Because there may be things that the Justice Center investigator talked about or, or came through in interviews that maybe weren't of concern to the Justice Center investigator, but they may cause you some, some sleepless nights. So read the investigation reports. Again, CAPS need to be submitted to OASIS within 10 days. Again, maintain records of any corrective actions as proof of implementation and follow up with OASIS after receiving the Justice Center CAP audit letter if necessary. And we'll help you as, as we can. Oh, and actually uh, that does raise a, uh, an important uh, side note. So when the Justice Center does do a CAP audit, uh, either on site or desk audit, uh, they will issue a findings letter to you. Um, so make sure that you reach out to us so that we can, you know, so that you can identify any actions you took to address those concerns um, and so that we're aware of them and if we can assist you in any way, please let us know. Now if you have questions or comments, you can send them to oversight and monitoring at oasis.ny.gov. This is the same place that you'd send any of the corrective action plans that we've requested. Um, we're we have a staff help. of thousands of people ready to help you. Yep. Thank you. So if you want to uh, reach out to us individually, uh, my contact, uh, Trisha Allen at oasis.ny.gov. And uh, David Herbert at oasis.ny.gov. Folks, this is Patty again, and I would like to just let you know, your feedback is appreciated. It does help us gauge if we're meeting the professional and educational needs and goals of the field. If you would like to take a moment and offer us your feedback, feel free to do so at the uh, SurveyMonkey link that is on the slide in front of you. All of that being said, again, thanks to Dave and Tricia for offering their time and their expertise. Thank you all for joining us once again. And to Media Services, thank you for the time and effort you put forth to help us provide this um, opportunity to our field. Be well, and we'll talk soon. Bye now.